Today we were studying the church of Laodicea. It is the seventh and the last of the seven churches our Lord sent to the churches of Turkey and Asia Minor. We read from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So that, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, but knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raven, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye sad, that thou mayest see. Now the city of Laodicea was founded by Antichus II in 250 BC. He named it after his wife Laodicea. It was located as a city at the narrow glen of the Lycus Valley where it poured into the Meander River which runs through the city of Ephesus. It was founded because it controlled the entrance to Phrygia. Now in verse 14, <clears throat> we have a description of Christ. He is the Amen. Did you know that Christ's name, one of His names, is Amen? It is so. Verse 14, these things saith the Amen. The word Amen is an untranslated word and it means something that is sure, established, and positive. When we say amen to the preacher or something that we agree with, we say amen. That means it is so. It is truth. I believe that. And because we believe the statement we heard, then we say amen. Because amen means truth. Jesus is the final word. He is the truth. There is no knowledge beyond Him. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in Him dwelleth all wisdom. He is the final word. No one can day, today can write any kind of a finality when it comes to spiritual truth because it's all comprehended in the New Testament and there isn't anywhere else you can go beyond the New Testament to find truth. He is the final word. Jehovah is the God of the Amen. He is Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God in Him are yea and in Him Amen unto the glory of God by us. Paul refers to this title in 2 Corinthians 1.20. Also, amen is translated truth. John 14.6 Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the amen, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the only way to the Father. He is the only way into heaven. There is no other way other than Him. Secondly, in verse 14, we learn that He is the faithful and true witness. 
Isaiah confirmed that in 65 and verse 16 when he said that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Our Lord is the God of truth. And Isaiah 65 and verse 16 should read properly the God of the Amen. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus begins his letter to Laodicea as identifying himself as the Amen. In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9, God is called the faithful. That is the Amen. God. Faithful God. In Isaiah 65, 16, He is called the God of truth. He can add Amen to anything that He says. Anything that Jesus says, He can add His Amen to it because He is truth. And everything He speaks is truth. Here in Revelation 3 and verse 14, Amen is one of his official titles. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen. Also in verse 14, he is the faithful and the true witness. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, he is called the ancient of days. Christ is the creator of all things. Now as we look at verse 14, we have to be careful how we understand that verse. It says the beginning of the creation of God. But our Lord Jesus Christ was never created. The Jehovah Witnesses and others who do not believe in the deity and the eternality of Christ will use that verse and try to make it mean that Jesus was a created being. Some even say he was a created angel. They lie. Jesus was never created. He is eternal. He has always been. He came from nowhere because he's always been somewhere. He's always been who and what he is. So don't ever let anyone tell you that this verse teaches that Jesus was a created being. How can he be a created being when he is said to be in John and other places the creator of the universe? He is the creator of all things. Well, if he is the creator of all things, he could not have been created. He is the creator. It means that he was the originator. He originated all that is. Every star in the heavens, every drop of water in the ocean, every blade of grass in your lawn. He is the creator of all things. He is also the one who brings all creation into being. There is nothing that he has not brought to pass. In John, we read chapter 1 and verse 3. All things. That's a comprehensive word there. In this particular place, it means all things. Were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing is made that wasn't made by Him. Every ocean, every mountain, every created thing in this world was made by Him. He is the originator. He is the creator. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him. 
and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That word consist is the same word that we use for our word glue. He is the one that glues the universe together. If the sun moved one inch away from its present position, we would freeze to death. If the sun moved one degree to the other side, we would freeze to death. Who holds the sun in its orbit to keep it from moving one iota? For if it moved, we would burn up or we would freeze to death. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things and by Him. All things consist. That word consist means glues together, stays together. Why don't the head, why don't the stars fall out of the sky? The same number of stars that He created are still in the heavens today. He holds them in his hands. And then it says in verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This church is dedicated to giving Christ the preeminence, the highest place of all things in our worship, in our study of the Bible, in everything we do as a church, we give Him the preeminence. The pastor does not have the preeminence. The deacons do not have the preeminence. The people do not have the preeminence. That in all things, He might have the preeminence. He is the preeminent one. Then the church of Laodicea represents the liberal churches. The very opposite of Trinity Baptist Church. We are fundamental, Bible-believing churches. We believe the Bible from cover to cover. I believe the cover, which says Holy Bible. We believe the Bible. We believe every word of the Bible. We believe that God, by divine inspiration, breathed out the words of the Bible. Words have meaning. And to understand the meaning of Scripture, you must go to His words. The definition of a word gives you the reason and the meaning of what's being said. So he speaks here now of Laodicea, a liberal church. A liberal church is one that does not believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. We believe in the virgin birth of Christ. The liberal churches do not believe in the Bible, in the virgin birth of Christ. Harry Emerson falls dead said no intelligent person believes in the virgin birth of Christ. He leaves some things that can be said about him. We believe he was born of the Virgin Mary by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. He had no human father. Only God was his father. Now these Laodicean churches, we have them today, they're liberal. Their preachers don't believe the Bible. They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe anything. The final great apostasy of the church is upon us today. I have a couple of examples of preachers who pastor these liberal churches. One of them said in Washington, D.C., and this is unbelievable, but this is what he said. We liberal clergymen 
are no longer interested in the fundamental modernist controversy. We do not believe we should even waste our time engaging in it. He doesn't believe he ought to waste any time standing for the truth of the Bible. So far, he said, as we are concerned, it makes no difference whether Christ was born of a virgin or not. We don't even bother to form an opinion on the subject. Now there's a man that's on his way to hell. I can say that without a doubt. He will go to hell. He will die in his sins. For if you believe not that Jesus was born of a virgin, then you have nothing but a human ordinary man. An ordinary man cannot save anybody. It takes the divine man. It takes the God man. It takes the man who came down from heaven and took manhood upon himself. It took that man. It takes him and him alone that can make an atonement that can save a soul from sin. And he says it makes no difference whether it was born of a virgin or not. I'll tell you what difference it makes. If he was not born of a virgin, then he was not the Christ of the Bible. And if he's not the Christ of the Bible, we have no Savior today. Our preaching is in vain. It's useless if Christ be not born of a virgin. You say, well, that's an impossibility. That makes it a miracle. He was born miraculously by the power of Almighty God. Another one in Arlington, Virginia, made this statement. We have closed our minds to such trivial consideration as the question of the resurrection of Christ. A trivial question? The resurrection of Christ? Trivial? Trivial means not important. Doesn't matter. I want you to know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave was not a trivial act. It was an act of divine power in which God the Father raised His Son from the dead. Trivial question. If there be no resurrection, then we will have no resurrection. Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also. If he didn't live beyond the grave, we won't either. But thank God, he did walk out of his tomb alive, was witnessed for 40 days by over 500 people who were still alive when the Apostle Paul wrote about the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ is the most fundamental question in the Bible. If Christ be not raised, we are all men most miserable, and we are yet in our sins, and we will die like dogs and be annihilated. But we're not dogs. We are God's people. And because He lives, we're going to live also. But these modernistic, liberal preachers ridicule the resurrection of Christ. They ridicule his virgin birth. What is wrong with them? Well, it's not that they were just wrongly taught. It's that in their depraved hearts and in their unintelligent minds, they hate God. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's wrong with them. They have never been saved. Those kind of men that make these kind of denials are not saved. They have never been saved and will never be saved unless they repent in dust and ashes and fall on their faces and confess their ungodliness to God and ask for forgiveness. I doubt that any of them will ever do that. Another one said flatly, in our denomination, what you call the faith of our fathers is approaching total distinction. Of course, he said, 
a few of the older ministers still cling to the Bible, but not him. But among the younger men, he said, the real leaders of our denomination today, I do not know of a single one who believes in Christ. Can you imagine that? Here's a leader among the men of the liberal clientele who says, I do not know of a single one of our ministers that you would classify as fundamentals or who believe in Christ. If they don't believe in Christ, what will they preach on Sunday morning to the people? The people are dead. The preacher is dead. And what will he preach to them? He preaches psychology, psychiatry, social betterment, love Mother Earth. Those are the things they spout from the pulpit. They're totally brain dead. And then in verse 17, our Lord gives some counsel to this Laodicean church. He says that first of all, he's going to correct their false opinion of themselves. He's going to give counsel to them. Dr. Jesus knows what to prescribe for every ailment. And he voices their ailment here and corrects their false opinion of themselves by saying in verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He said, you're not rich. You call yourself rich. You think you're rich. You're poor, blind, miserable, and naked. You think you're good. He says, you're not good. He corrects them. He uses five different adjectives to describe their ungodliness and their lost condition. Now this city of Laodicea was a very wealthy city. Whenever the Seleucid kings wanted to get free citizenship for Jews in their city, they would offer the Jews certain plantations to come settle in their city. They wanted the Jews to come among them. They hated the Jews, but they wanted them for business reasons to come into their city. So they would offer free citizenship to every Jew that moved into Laodicea. They wanted Jews. Why? Because Jews always brought trade and commerce with them when they came. That's why they wanted them. That's why they offered them free citizenship. Because they knew that if Jews came into their midst, the Jews would bring prosperity and economical wellness to their city. I was reading the other day of a traveler on a train. He was sitting there reading his newspaper and suddenly a gray-haired Jew walked up and sat down beside him. And he looked over at the Jew in disdain and he said to the Jew, are you a Jew? He said, yes, sir, I am a Jew. He said, well, in our village, we don't allow any Jews. And the Jew said, exactly, that's why it's a village. Much of the wealth of Laodicea came from their garment in industry. They had a breed of sheep which produced a type of wool found nowhere else in the world. It was black and glossy 
and it was highly valued and it was used to make very precious garments. Laodicea manufactured four different kinds of garments that you couldn't buy anywhere else. And this garment caused Laodicea to be referred to sometimes as Trimetaria. And so the Lord admonishes them to buy from him white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He said, why don't you come to me? I can give you fine raiment that you can't get anywhere else. He's speaking of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. The fine garment that Jesus offers and gives to his people is divine righteousness, which they cannot achieve by themselves. Then this church disgusted Jesus. In fact, he told them he was going to spit them out of his mouth. When you put something in your mouth that's bitter or that doesn't taste right and it burns your throat, you spit it out. You don't want to swallow it. You don't want to receive it. And that's the way Jesus regarded this church of Laodicea. The most important thing about this church is it represents the one church that's representative of all others in a certain extent. Verse 14 through 16 says they were lukewarm. That is, they were indifferent. In the district of Laodicea, there were hot mineral springs that sometimes cooled off just enough to make them cheapened and undrinkable. And these were wonderful springs, but when they would cool down, they were drinkable. But otherwise, they were warm. And you know what happens if you drink warm water? Everything comes up. So he said to them in verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. That word hot comes from the word zestos, taken from zeal, which means to boil. I would like to have you boiling hot, not lukewarm. Verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now lukewarm water is used as an emetic. It helps it, something on your stomach to come back up. They were a people who were not ardent. They had no enthusiasm, no emotion, no zeal, no urgency. They just sat like dead people in their pews and listened, no doubt, to a dead preacher. And God used these five adjectives along with one noun to describe their condition. He said, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. They were a poor bunch. And he disowns them. Spurgeon, the great preacher in England, had this to say. He said they were not cold, but they were not hot. They were not infidels, yet they were not earnest believers. He said they did not oppose the gospel, neither did they defend it. He said they were not working mischief, neither were they doing any good. They were not disreputable in moral character, but they were not distinguished for holiness. They were not irreligious, but they were not enthusiastic in piety, nor eminent for zeal, 
They were what the world calls moderates. Lord, deliver us from what the world calls moderates. In such communities, Spurgeon said, everything was done half-heartedly, listlessly, dead and alive way, as if it did not matter much whether it was done or not. But as to doing them with all your might and all your soul and all your strength, the lad you see in church had no notion of what that meant. In verse 18, he uses another background reference to point out their need. And anoint thine eyes with eye sand that thou mayest see. Jesus is the great ophthalmologist. He can open your eyes. Laodicea had a very famous medical center in which they had found a medicine which was found nowhere else that would heal a stain over the eyes. And people came from all over the world because no one else had this medicine. And they would get treatment and it would clear up the problems with their eyes. It was called Tifa Phrygia, a tablet bought all over the Roman Empire. It was crushed and put on the eyes and it would heal the ailment of the eyes. So Jesus took that medical background and becomes the ophthalmologist. He's gonna tell them what's wrong with their eyes. And he does. And he heals the eyes of those that he opens. I read a story not long ago called The Emperor's New Clothes. The story goes like this. There were two charlatan tailors who conjured up the incredible tale that they were going to cater to the king's conceit and pride. Supposedly, they were going to weave a garment for him that only the intelligent and only the good and only those of high morals could even see it. And the king said, that's what I want. I want you to make a garment like that that could only be worn by the intelligent and those that are high up. And they said, all right, we'll do it. And when we get through, it'll be so beautiful, nobody will be able to see it unless they're intelligent and honest and good. So they said, come back in a month. So in a month, the king came back, said, let me see my garment. And so they came and held something up. They didn't have anything in their hands. They, they held their hands up and said, see, isn't it beautiful? Well, the king didn't want to admit that he couldn't say anything about it being beautiful because that would mean he was not smart and not good and all those things that were required to be able to see it. So I said, oh yes, it's beautiful. So he said, I think I'll have a parade and I will ride my horse down the street so all the people can see my beautiful new garment. The king thought he had a garment. So he gets on his horse, he rides down the street, and the people are lining the street, and they have been brought into this little bit of trickery, and so they knew better than not to say anything. So they waved and said, oh, how lovely, how beautiful, O king, is those garments you're wearing. Actually, the king wasn't wearing anything. And finally, one little boy who hadn't been brought in onto the plan looked at the king and he shouted out, the king is naked! And God is saying that to the church of Laodicea. You're blind and naked. Now they thought they were a wealthy church. They thought they were 
everything they ought to be. But they were nothing that they ought to be. Jesus is trying to get them to see that they are not what they think they are. And many, many Christians, professing Christians today, are not what they think they are. They think that they are this and they are that. But Jesus looks into the soul. He looks deep into the heart. And He knows what we are. He knows who we are. And He knows our condition. And He cannot be deceived. And so He says to those Laodiceans, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Here is the position of Christ in reference to the Laodicean church. He is on the outside. They are on the inside. He stands at the door outside the church and knocks. And he says, if any man hear my voice. He didn't say that to the church. He said, if any man, he knows the church will reject him. He has been knocking. They have not opened the door to him. So he says, therefore, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Jesus was not in that church. They claimed him, but they didn't have him. There's a lot of churches today that claim Jesus that don't have him. He's outside their churches. I read of an old black man one time who visited one of these kind of churches. It was a large, affluent church. Wealthy people. Huge church. And he got up one Sunday morning to go to church and he found that the church was closed. Nobody there. So he said, well, I'll just walk down to this big white church and I'll just worship with them this morning. So he goes down to this big white church and as he steps in the front door, two deacons met him. And they said, uh, you can't come in here. We don't allow any black people in our church. You can't come in. You'll have to go somewhere else. And they refused to let him come in. So he turned around and he went back home. And he said, Lord, this don't seem right to me. I'm a Christian. They claim to be Christians. And they won't even let me come in and worship with them. He said, Lord, it just don't seem right to me. Why should that be? And he said, the Lord said to him, Well, don't feel bad. I've been trying for 40 years to get in that church and they won't let me in either. If any man would hear my voice, I suppose in these kind of churches, and there are a lot of them today, there's a few people that might know the Lord. There might be an individual that isn't saved. Jesus says to him, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. Verse 21, he speaks about the reward that he has for us who serve him. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Now, would you notice there, my Father...
sit with me, you will get to sit with me, or I will sit with my father in his throne. Then he mentions a second throne. I am set down with my father in his throne. So what do we have here? We have the father's throne. We have his throne. Two thrones. Jesus will sit down and he has gone to heaven. He is sitting now at the right hand of the father. He is sitting with the father on his throne right now. When he comes back, he is going to take the throne of David, which is empty today. And he's going to sit on David's throne. Read 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel. He's going to sit on David's throne on this earth. And we are going to rule and reign with him on this earth, with him in his throne. So here's the Father's throne. He's sitting at the Father's throne now. He's coming to earth soon. He's going to sit on David's throne. And he's going to rule the earth. And we're going to rule and reign with him. Now how many thrones do you get out of that? You get two thrones. The Father's throne and Jesus' throne. Uh, David's throne. Two thrones. I went to school in a one-room schoolhouse. About 10 miles from where I live, out in the country. And it was very, very cold. And the way I got to school is the neighbor boy on the farm next door would come by in his horse and buggy. He had an old horse named Duke. And he would bring that buggy by, and I and two or three other children from the neighborhood, we'd all get in the buggy, and it was terribly cold, so we'd all take a big blanket, and we'd cover up with that blanket, and get in the buggy, and he would get Duke out on the highway, on the Monk County Road, and start Duke down the road. And we'd stay under that warm blanket, and pretty soon, We'd feel the wagon moving along the buggy. And then we'd feel a tip, and we knew what was happening. Duke was going down in the bar pit. He wanted to turn around and go back home. It was cold. And so the boy that owned the horse, he would pull the blanket off of his head. He would pull the reins. He'd get Duke back up on the road, get him started down the road again, and Duke would take us on all the way to school. So I went to this little one-room schoolhouse. And I learned something. I learned that one plus one equal two. And that four plus four equal eight. Now today, when we speak as pre-tribulationists about two thrones, they say, oh, no, 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 there's only one throne. And we say, no, there's two thrones. Who's right? Them with their one throne or us with the two thrones? Well, I'm glad I went to that little one-room schoolhouse. I learned some things. And nobody yet has been able to convince me that one plus one equals one. I don't believe one plus one equals one. I believe one plus one equals two in the realm of mathematics. <coughs> And they can have one throne if they want to, but they're wrong. Because the Bible teaches two thrones. The Father has a throne, 
And Jesus has his, uh, David has a throne and Jesus will take David's throne. That's two thrones. And the wonder of it all is that we're going to sit with him in his throne on this earth <clears throat> and rule the nations as he rules them with a rod of iron. Jesus is coming and we are going to be allowed the privilege of sitting with him at David's throne as he rules the world. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank Thee today that we believe the Bible, every word of it. And we pray that Thou would bless the words that have been spoken today that might be a blessing to someone, and that those who do not know the Lord might turn to Him. In Jesus' name, Amen.